And that is a record here on the Open Series by far. As the sixth seed, however, or the seventh seed, however, though, Todd will be on the draw in this matchup as we get underway. Jared starts on Lanoir Wastes and Warden of the First Tree. Now, you mentioned that Todd is not a Mantis Riderless build of Jeskai Black and going to have to settle into a much stronger control role than you would normally expect. Yeah, if you look at Eric Smith's build, for example, you have cards like Manus Rider and Tassiger, the Golden Fang, hanging out on the list. Those are cards, while powerful, trade pretty easily with a variety of removal spells and knobs on aggro. On the other hand here, Todd is, is not messing around with any of that stuff. He's trying to turn the abs on aggro's removal spells into very inefficient pieces, and I think that serves him well in game one. Well, Warden of the First Tree will hit in for three to start the game for Jared. Jared's list of obs and aggro, nothing fancy going on here. Nearly all the creatures, four ofs. His spells, mostly four ofs as well. Jermokas, Obzons, Gideons. Uh, two wingmate rocks to top the curve, and that's about it. As Todd will just start on two lands, we build toward turn three. Todd does have one of his main deck copies of Negate in hand. Multiples of those today, which I imagine have served him well in a lot of these Jeskai Black Mirrors. That card, though, can be has the chance to be dead against something like Obzon Aggro. Not necessarily dead, as there are a lot of spells, but it's possible for the game to be played at such a fast clip that it's hard to hold up the gate. If Bower is just carving out with creatures, naturally there's not a lot to be done with that card. Yeah, and that's what Bower's going to try to do. His turn three play was another attack for three, a Den Protector face up, and then followed by Shambling Vent. So two creatures. The second one not as large, but he did get that threat of the Manland into play. And this happens a lot when the deck opens on turn one Warden. No spell in the graveyard to get back, and you want to keep up the pressure. So Den Protector ends up getting played face up in a lot of these situations. You know, that is something you hit on here. This weekend, we have seen more face up Den Protectors than I've been used to seeing, I'll say. Yeah. Todd, yet to cast a spell, but great mana passes the turn. Crackling Doom and Negate, both in hand. And we'll see what kind of pressure he brings. Here's the swing with both creatures. Is Todd going to pull the, the trigger on a removal spell? The answer is no. He's just going to go ahead and pass the do nothing. So that's a pass of the turn for Jared. Now Todd has options. He has Crackling Doom. He has Kolagon's Command. Crackling Doom here, that'll take care of Warden of the First Tree. Now, he didn't play this one in combat. Mm -hmm. What is, you know, took a lot of life points for that. Probably holding, I, I'm guessing the, the decision here is to hold up the gate to tag a potential Gideon. Interesting player by Jared. So what he does is in response to the Crackling Doom, he puts a counter on Warden of the First Tree or rather on Den Protector, so that he can choose to sacrifice the Den Protector instead of the Warden there. That's a pretty costly use of Dromoka's command. Yes, I, I suppose you would want the three toughness threat over the two toughness threat uh, to uh, prevent something like Fiery Impulse or Kolgon's command finishing off the Den Protector, but Dromoka's command is also good there as well. Yeah. Uh, you notice he did not take damage. The second mode on Dromoka's command was to prevent the damage also off Crackling Doom. But the use of a spell there may be happy with it. We go back over to Todd. He has a Soulfire Grandmaster. And we look back at the rest of his hand. Dig through time, negate, and Kolagon's command for Todd. It's actually a lot of weapons. He's low on life points, but this doesn't seem to be playing out particularly poorly for him. It's, it's going to be a, a little bit tough here. If he can swallow up Bower's turn with the negate, then things become a lot easier. But if Bauer just keeps on cranking out creatures, it's going to be hard for Todd to defend himself in time. Yeah, now there is one thing I wanted to point out here. So Todd, we saw, taking three so that he could end step Crackling Doom, um, playing these, you know, turns very conservatively. And a lot of that has to do with Gideon and the fact that he had a negate in hand. Because he has no Mantis Riders, he seems like, does he have to be very conservative where it's when it comes to Gideon? Yes, I, I think so, and that, that's a bit of a hole in the armor for Todd's build. We, we saw him struggle a little bit with it earlier on. With Crackling Doom and Colgon's command, he can cobble together some sideways ways to answer it, and he does have uh, copies of Utterin as well, so he has some answers, but without flyers, without haste, Planeswalkers are a lot more threatening for Todd's build. Yeah, now Jared does have the Gideon, but doesn't have to run anything into that. He plays Siege Rhino post-combat. That puts Todd down to two, and now on the ropes... We go back to Jared's turn. Will Todd even be able to survive the turn? He has a negate, a Colgon's command, and two dig through times. A lot of powerful spells, but he's just running out of life points. Yep. Was not able to break serve against this warden. Did not have 
any fiery impulses available, and the damage has just been adding up turn after turn. Yeah, it just feels like a bind. You know, Jared has had the Gideon that Todd was playing around the whole time, but would never needed to go for that, needed to commit it. And you see Jared, he's going to go for the win here. It's murderous cut on Soulfire Grandmaster. He delves three pays two. If Todd lets this one die, he certainly won't be able to win. So he may, he's going to have to pull the trigger, but still not certain he makes it out of the turn. At two life, we'll see the play from Todd Anderson. Here's three mana. It looks like he's going to go for Kolagon's Command. Two damage to Warden of the First Tree. And has Jared, I believe, discard a card. So gains life. And then we'll go ahead and negate the Murderous Cut. And Bauer just moves into combat and kills him here. So that's that. So game one goes to Jared Bauer. A quick affair there. Obs on Agar, a game on Jeskai Black. We do like Todd's control build of it, but down a game, he's already risking his tournament life. I mean, Bauer just started off on the play with a Warden, had creatures on most turns while Todd was sitting on the gate, and Todd, Todd, yeah, Todd excuse me, could never catch up. Yeah, very, very dominant display there for Jared Bauer. We'll go ahead and look at the sideboarded games. Something that you can notice when Todd is playing such a control build of the deck is that he has the flexibility to really morph with his sideboard. Let's go through what he can do. Well, he's got three copies of Infinite Obliteration, two of Roshan Cleric, two Radiant Flames, a Master of the Unseen, an Erase, a Felidar Cub, a Dispel, a Disdainful Stroke, two copies of Painful Truths, and one copy of Virulent Plague. I think the, the counter spells and dispel, dispel and Disdainful Stroke alongside Match the Unseen will come in, and the two copies of Painful Truths. I know that Bauer is on the aggressive side, but I think that Todd kind of wants to just make his land drops, counter some stuff, gas back up, rinse and repeat, and wear Bauer out of resources. He definitely can do that. Um, and I do like a lot of those strategies that he does to do that. Absolutely right. We look at Jared Bauer's sideboard. So, so many four ofs in the main deck, but when we look at the sideboard, uh, it's most, it's, it's very low on creatures and has a lot of different kill spells. Um, because Todd's control, maybe he doesn't go toward those, but can he go for it? Well, he has two Duress, two Self-Inflicted Wound, two Silk Rep, a Soren Solemn Visitor, two copies of Tassiker, three copies of Transgress the Mind, two Ultimate Price, two Wingmate Rock. A lot of reasonable options here. I like Silk Rep a lot in this matchup, as all of Todd's threats are cheap enough for it to be exiled by Silk Rep, and it prevents them from coming back via Ojatai's Command which is an important dimension for Anderson's deck. The two copies of Duress are great here as well. And he can play a bit of a longer game himself with Soren, Tassiker, and three copies of Transgress the Mind. Yeah, he can't play that game. So stuff like Duress, you know, Todd's so heavy on spells. You know, we have seen Obs on Aggro do things like Duress and then Den Protector back Duress to punch holes in the armor of Jeskai Black. Yeah, and that's a very solid game plan. Anderson has a lot of card advantage in this list, so he's not as vulnerable to that as some other builds of Jeskai Black. But the more that Bauer can attack his spells, the better off he's going to be. And we'll definitely see that. Todd gets to be on the play this turn, this for game two, but he'll have to win both the sideboard games. The players shuffle up. One, one thing of note, you know, ne this weekend we are covering right now the Star City Games Philadelphia Open. Next week, you're actually going to be in the booth with Cedric covering Grand Prix Atlanta. We have that coming up. Now, a lot of things that weekend uh, also were the, the premiere of the new Magic Commander set, and that's coming along. We have that product as well, these singles and event decks from the event. You can order them and actually pick them up at Grand Prix Atlanta if you're going to be joining us for the Grand Prix next week. Absolutely. You can go onto the website right now at go.starcygames.com slash commander2015. Order your sealed product and your singles right now. If you're able to order before noon Eastern time this coming Monday, you can pick it up on site for free at GP Atlanta. We'll have that there at the Grand Prix. You guys are covering it. We'll all be there for the meet and greet on Friday. Uh, I'll be winning the event, so you'll see lots of me just on that side great. of the screen. Winner's interview. Yeah, yeah, it'll be great. We'll just you have, can talk we'll about hang the out in the booth. You can talk about the commander products you like, <laughs> what singles yeah, strike yeah. you as things you could add to your commander decks. I do like what there's a cycle of cards out of commander that uh, they have, they're these cryptic command style things. There's three modes, and then you choose three, and you can pick the same one three times. Big fan of those guys. Yeah, you can triple up. I saw the blue one was... One of them's draw cards. It's already great. Draw cards, mana leak, something else. Don't recall. Doesn't even matter. If I, if yeah, I I'm, never, I'm never doing anything but mixing those those modes up anyway. So. I mean, I like Dismiss, which is four mana counterspell draw cards, so I would gladly pay five for counterspell draw two cards. So that seems excellent. Yeah. And if they don't play a spell, sure, we'll just uh, Jace's Ingenuity. I'm, okay, fine by me. 
All right, we are underway. Game two, Todd Anderson on the play starts off on a dual land. And once again for Jared, it is Warden of the First Tree. He has that curve out. So this time, Todd gets to have the advantage of being up a land. We'll see if he can manage the onslaught. As we go back to Bauer. And same line as before. Pump Warden of the First Tree, swing in for three. Brutally efficient. And you can see Anderson already has his plan set up here. He's got Radiant Flames and Painful Truths in hand. So his goal in this game, remove, gas back up, continue to do that until Bauer runs out of cards. Interesting to see if this is good enough for him to Radiant Flames or if he's going to use turn three to Painful Truths here, hoping to get a little bit more. Yeah, that is a very painful, painful truth. There'd be three on the cast and three more on the hit from the Warden of the First Tree. But when you have a sweeper like that, I would assume he wants to get more mileage out of it than just a single kill spell. We'll see if he can afford to do so. Looks like Disdainful Stroke, Dig Through Time, Soulfire Grandmaster, and Lands to accompany the Converge spells. And nothing fancy. Todd will just play a three mana kill spell for Warden. That's Radiant Flames. And if he casts Painful Truths that turn, he has to discard a hand size anyway. And it's probably too obvious that something weird's going on. Yeah, if that's that's very strange. So uh, probably best serve for Anderson just to remove the threat from the table. The higher he can keep his life total, the more and more he can lean on Painful Truths to be a huge source of card advantage. And if you haven't seen it before, welcome to Zendikar with these Battlelands. Jared Bauer, we, as we've seen with a lot of obs on aggro decks, goes, mount, goes uh, forest into plains into dual land of the other two colors. That's going to be a red-black duel as he makes a turn three and a Fensa. We're back on Todd's side. You know, he did not actually, he was a one for one when he cast Radiant Flames. So still lots of threats to get through. And he does not have a clean answer to Anafenza at the moment. Disdainful Stroke, Soulfire Grandmasters, Dig Through Time, great cards, but 4 4 is just a little big for him. And now Todd's in the bind here where he has to decide do I leave up Disdainful Stroke or do I draw three? If he doesn't draw three, he risks just getting killed by Anafenza beatdowns because he has no answer. If he taps out, he takes a lot of points from the Painful Truce, takes a lot of points from the attack, and he's exposed to Siege Rhino. Right yeah, I mean. Right, and that you just hit the nail on the head there. If he takes this four, takes three off Painful Truths, and then the Siege Rhino had resolved, he would be at such a low life total. It would be nearly dead. As it is, Jared goes for the Siege Rhino anyway, and I think Todd gets the victory out of this. He was able to cast Disdainful Stroke. Yeah, that's a huge win for Todd. Now you line things up the other way, and Todd is looking at six life points, facing down two creatures. He may just be dead the next turn. Now we go over to Todd's side. It is going to be Painful Truths, and painful indeed. Three colors. Todd will go down to nine. He draws Fiery Impulse and two lands. And he will have to fetch to play Soulfire Grandmaster. He drew a battle land, but only a basic swamp in play. So this will drop him down to a low eight life points. This is a risky spot for Todd. And I believe still no answer to Anafenza. He's going to have to do some double blocking. He's going to need multiple removal spells, something like that. Yeah, he did draw a Fiery Impulse. So next turn, and this is obviously not great, he can block and Fiery Impulse the Anafenza and then, and then hope Jared has nothing like Dramoka's Command or Obzon Charm. As it stands, Jared will swing. He puts Todd down to a very low four life points, and the follow-up play is Tassiger the Golden Fang. Just another four power creature. Todd couldn't deal with one the first time, and I, he is hard pressed to deal with one the second time. Draw for Todd was Disdainful Stroke. He has more Soulfire Grandmasters in hand. Keep in mind that the lifelink ability on Soulfire does not improve as you play more of them. Down to three life off the fetch. He has Disdainful Stroke, multiple Soulfires, a Fiery Impulse, and Dig Through Time. And the mana isn't quite as clean as it looks. If Todd wants to play a Soulfire Grandmaster this turn, he has to go ahead and uh, not be able to cast Dig Through Time as well, but it looks like he has other plans. Yeah, and this is actually a great line for him. So remember that he has Spell Mastery and his Soulfire Grandmaster gives things lifelink. So what he does is he activates Soulfire Grandmaster, then he casts Fire Impulse on Tassiger, then he gets back this Fire Impulse, casts it again on Tassiger, so Tassiger dies, Todd gains six life, then he swings Grandmaster, and that was a total of eight life points gained for Todd at the cost of one card. That was fantastic. And he will need those life points indeed, because Anafenza hits him down to seven again. Jared follows up with Siege Rhino, and as impressive as those eight life points were, he's going to have to go give seven of them right back. Yeah, and, and Todd is now facing two lethal threats. Yeah, the Fiery Impulse is gone because Todd had to tap out there. He was not able to hold up this Stainful Stroke for Siege Rhino. 
He was able to load up the graveyard, so he now can get a pretty well power to dig through time. It would only cost him two. If he can dig into the right card, he may be able to get out of this. But his mana not cooperating as much as he might like. If he pays double blue for dig through time, he'll be without white mana. And with his hand just being copies of Soulfire Grandmaster and other copies of Dig Through Time, he's going to need a lot of help here. Yeah, so he's going to go ahead and cast Dig Through Time. He's left with only black and red mana sources. So if he wants to keep really a, a blue or white card, he's going to have to take a land with it too here. Dangerous spot to be. Delves away everything but the Radiant Flames. And here's seven cards. One of them is a Plains. He at least has access to that. Finds Utter End, some lands. And if he wants to take Utter End and cast it this turn, he has to take the white mana as well. Same deal with Crackling Doom, as his only white mana is the Prairie Stream, and he had to commit that to cast the Dig Through Time. Yeah, it looks like one of the two cards was spent on a Plains. Plains, Disdainful Stroke. Looks like he took Crackling Doom alongside the Plains. Still not, I don't believe he has enough white mana to do all of that. Crackling yeah, he, Doom and Soulfire. He, he could, also can't Crackling Doom and hold up Disdainful Stroke. I mean, uh, we're used to Anderson's mana being kind of perfect once he hits seven lands. Yeah, but we haven't even been counting it. I just assumed he could do everything. And, and he cannot right now. His mana's being pulled in a lot of different directions. There's a Plains Hill Pass. So he has a Crackling Doom and a Chump Block. Looks like the line for him. If he waits until Anafenza puts a counter on Siege Rhino, he can ensure that Crackling Doom hits the Rhino instead of the Anafenza, which because of Trample... Maybe, I think is a must. Yeah, well, Todd's got a lot of cards in hand, other copies of Soulfire Grandmaster. He can chump block for a while. It's, it's just a trampler that he can't really handle, so wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. Well, here's the swing. A counter goes on Siege Rhino. And now Crackling Doom. Jared has an obs on Charm in hand, so he could... If he's willing to spend it on the Anafenza, he could have saved the Rhino, but not going to go that way. Here's the swing. Todd gains two off Crackling Doom, goes to six, and then has to chump block. So Soulfire Grandmaster's down, but Todd's up to eight. And not good news for Todd here either. A face down more from Jared. Only one creature that could be, that's a Den Protector. And you look at Jared's graveyard, mo multiple Siege Rhinos at the ready, Warden, Tassiger. This is a scary creature. Although Todd does have Disdainful Stroke. If Bauer goes for one of the threats here, he can answer it. Yeah, if he goes for a Rhino, he can stop it. You see Todd plays Soulfire Grandmaster. Another Soulfire Grandmaster passes the turn. I mean, he can kind of trade off here. If Bauer's got nothing going on, he can try to double block the NFNs and get off the table or just try to chump block over the course of two turns. He's got another copy of Dig Through Time. It's not possible for, for not impossible rather, for Anderson to get over the hump here. You know, I think you're right. He's got a line. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. If if Todd pulls this together and forces a game three, this will be a real impressive feat on his side. It looked like he was just getting mashed. Yeah. And, and his hand, he couldn't cast things efficiently. They weren't even answers to the threats that Bauer was presenting. But it feels like Anderson's kind of wormed his way back into this one. Yeah, it's that curve out that, you know, that over in the we were talking with Tyler Barnett about. Warden, pump it. So 3-3 three, three on turn two, then an Anafenza, then a Rhino, then a Rhino. That's been Jared's plan all along. It's, you know, it's not complicated, but it sure is efficient. So we go back. Jared did buy back one of those Siege Rhinos, plays another land. Remember, Jared has a Shambling Vent and now land eight. So we might see the two, three enter the battle zone as well. He has enough mana left over, I believe, to cast the Siege Rhino if he activates the Shambling Vent. I think so too. That's what eight will do. Two Shambling Vents in play. Just so many options at Bauer's disposal. And here's one of the Shambling Vents. He'll tap three to activate. So Shambling Vent, Anafenza, Den Protector. Remember, Anafenza can start putting counters on Shambling Vent. That's even more terrifying for Todd. And the swings will happen. Counter goes on to, it looks like, Den Protector. Makes it into a 4-3. Todd's going to go ahead and double block Shambling Vent. And I love this double block here from Todd. Uh, I think he feels like he is playing right now the planner outburst. He's got to be able to answer the whole board. And so getting the creature land off the table has got to be the top priority. It's interesting. Jared does have an obs on charm in hand. He could go for the blowout. He's, he's not going to, however. So Shambling Vent trades with the Soulfire Grandmaster. 
Chad would take a lethal eight, but he has four points of lifelink, so he'll end the turn on four. And we'll see if Jared wants to try, attempt to make Rhino into that open mana. I assume so, because he didn't swing the second Shambling Vent, but perhaps not. I think he's having some second thoughts here after Anderson's block. Yeah. I think he, he, he might be looking out for Planner Outburst now. Ojatai's command, the draw for Todd. Though if you're playing around something like Disdainful Stroke, there is still, um, there's still a concern because if he has enough mana, then Todd can start Disdainful Stroking with uh, Soulfire ability. Well, I, I think that Bauer, Bauer's perspective right now is I'm hammering him on the board. It's not very easy for him to remove these threats. If I just keep attacking and he keeps spinning his tires the way that he's, go that he's been doing for the last couple turns, yeah, I'm, eventually, I'm eventually going to win. But if I put the Siege Rhino into play and then I get hit with Planner Outburst, I've got very little going on. All right, so here's what we see from Todd. It's going to be an, an Ojatai's Command. We'll check modes here. If gain four, draw a card looks to be what he selected. And Crackling Doom is a pretty big draw here for Todd. Now he's in a spot where if Bauer goes ahead and makes a move with the NFNs of pumping up the Den Protector, suddenly that's a five power creature. You can crackly do that and get it off the table. NFNs is not the fastest clock. Yeah, you're right, it's back up to eight. Todd did have mana problems earlier with a little too much of red-black, but now does have the mana for both Disdainful Stroke and Crackling Doom. He's, he's still alive. It's not out of the woods yet, but he's getting closer. Yeah, given how the game started and how many oh, times yeah. Todd's had to chump block and, and, and do some awkward things with his removal spells, He's still drawing live. We look back to Jared Bauer. And there's so many different things that Bauer has to play around, too. This is a very complicated deck to play against. Yeah. Activates Shambling Vent. His hand is Obzon Charm, Siege Rhino. Go to combat. But before that trigger, it's going to be Crackling Doom. This will put Todd up to 10. Remember, he's going to gain life off this. What does Jared want to sack? Remember, he also has an Obzon Charm. Not irrelevant here. He's going to sack sacrifice the Anafenza. Here comes Shambling Vent and Den Protector. Both in. I think Todd's taking the full amount of damage. Goes down to four. Jack gains life. Gonna try for the Siege Rhino, but one card in Todd's hand, and we both know what it is. It's good here, too. Yeah, the Sample Stroke is, is perfect here. This will knock down Todd down to two, but remember, he gets an attack with Soulfire Grandmaster. If he can find an answer for the Den Protector, He's in yeah, very he's good, in good shape. shape. And most of the spells that he draws, he's going to be able to rebuy with Soulfire Grandmaster. So it's even better than it looks like on the surface. Here's the post-combat Rhino. That's going to get countered immediately. Yeah. Disdainful Stroke for it. It's in the graveyard. And we'll go back to Todd, see what he can draw here. He's got a lot of outs, actually. Any sort of kill spell. Say he draws a Fiery Impulse even here. Buyback with Impulse, the Den Protector. Todd has the lead now. He pulls way ahead with Fire Impulse. He gets to rebuy. He gets to gain three off the Fire Impulse, plus two for the Soulfire Grandmaster attack. Now, remember, last card in Bower's hand is Obzon Charm, and um, there's going to be some ways here where even if, if Anderson is able to draw a kill spell for the Den Protector, the Obzon Charm alongside the Shambling Vent may still kill Anderson, but right. there's hope. You know, and... Obzon Charm has really struggled to gain value in this matchup, just watching it here. There's never been a great spot for Jared to pump. Uh, certainly nothing to kill. It's, it's a little, it's playing out like a clunky draw spell. And that's, Todd hits there it, it's it Fiery you see, Impulse. You see the nod, he knows what that one's worth. Wow, and, and Todd just threading the needle all game. Here's Fiery Impulse, it takes down Den Protector. Todd back up to five. He gets the Impulse back in hand as well. Take that, Shambling Vent. Here comes Soulfire Grandmaster. Two damage in. Jared down to 11. Todd up to 7. Boy, how things have changed. We are back to Jared Bauer. And three mana. This is his draw for the turn. It's Anafens of the Foremost. Great draw from Jared. Still has that Obzon Charm in hand. He'll pass. Not out of the woods yet for Todd, though he, that fiery impulse is going to do so much work. He can buy it back every turn just to gain life. Well, now he's in a spot where he can, I believe, buy it back twice. I think that polluted delta he just drew is land number 10. Yeah, so he can do two fiery impulses with buyback per turn, as long as he has something to find, which he should. He'll sacrifice polluted delta, go down to six. 
man, how much work is Soulfire Grandmaster doing? Todd gets six life off of this. Yeah, gets to kill Anafenza, gets six life points. And I think Bauer's been sitting on this copy of Abzan Charm, I think in part because he didn't quite know what he wanted to do with it. Maybe he wanted to draw cards. Maybe he wanted to pump something. Right. I think we've gotten to a spot now where he needs to draw two. I mean, <laughs> he needs to do something. And I think maybe in response, with that Fiery Impulse on the stack, you may want to try to make that play. And yeah, two Fiery Impulses with buyback. If you're Jared, you, you need to get rid of this Soulfire Grandmaster. If there's a Silkrap anywhere in your library, it's, it, you need to make it get to your hand. It looks like Bauer is going in the other direction here. Is he putting counters on the, the Anafensa? Uh, well, that wouldn't save it. It's, it's Spell Mastery. Sure. So, yeah, he's just drawing two now. Yeah, Gideon and Den Protector are the grabs. So, Todd, tons of life. Gains six, gains eight. He's now ahead, but not out of the woods yet. Den Protector was the one of the draws for Jared, so he should, in theory, get to kill this Soulfire Grandmaster, and he'll need to do that. Yeah, I mean, he he's really gassed back up here with Gideon, Den Protector. Two Den Protectors. The draw for the turn was a second one. Now he's down to six life points. Things are not great, but if he kills the Soulfire Grandmaster, at least he shuts off this engine of, of infinite kill spells. And Todd's build is very light on haste. There's no Manus Riders, there's no copies of Sarkin, so Bauer can afford to go pretty low. And we're checking, actually, need to do a check, make sure he actually has a kill spell in the Grapefruit. He's played a lot of great things. I don't know if he's played a kill spell this turn. It may just be all rhinos and creatures. And, and if that's the case, that's that's very bad news for Jared. Creatures it, are going to get gunned down by this Grandmaster. His Dead Protector, his copy of Gideon, these are not worth a whole lot if he can't break it up. And he can't, so he's going to scoop the game. So Todd Anderson, what is it? <laughs> With the comeback, you see it on his face. That is not a match we expect. He expected to win. It's not a match. We expected him to win, but win it he did and evens things up at one game apiece. Uh, I, I think that concession may have been a little bit early there from, from Bauer. As long as he leaves back the shambling vent, there's no attack for Todd to really yeah, make. Yeah, it's... It's a little early, but, you know, it, it just goes to show you, Bauer drew what on the surface looked to be pretty well off of his copies of... Uh, off his copy of Dazzle, yeah. He was up to two down protectors and a Gideon. That feels like... There's got to be the tools there somehow to be able to work around this, but his draw, as you mentioned, was all creatures and Obzon Charm. Obzon Charm can't touch the Soulfire Grandmaster. None of his creatures are worth very much in the face of, of Soulfire Grandmaster plus Fiery Impulse plus all that mana, and Todd was able to, to wiggle his way out of that one. That, that looked like he was beat several times. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree here. There And, you know, there were some outs he had to play to, so... When he hit the Grandmaster, we talked about, boy, if he draws Fire Impulse, he's back in it. But he put himself in a situation to draw that. And once he did, he was able to turn the corner and take the game. Uh, I, I agree. I think you're right that with two Den Protectors at the end there, it maybe, I mean, I don't know if he has any good lines. If he doesn't have a kill spell waiting, it may just be buying time. But Den Protector can buy time. That's something it's, it's allowed to do. He can Den Protector back a Siege Rhino. That Gives him three life to play with, does a little bit of damage right. to Todd as well. So, yeah, felt a little preemptive, but um, I, I think Todd was pulling ahead quite a bit there in that spot regardless. And in any event, we're going to be going to game three in a moment. Yeah, absolutely. So this game, Todd will be back on the draw. We have seen Jared have two exceptional curve outs. Each time it's been turn one Warden, turn two Pump It, and offends a Rhino. He's had that two games in a row on, and it's been just really threatening from Todd's side of the board. Um, that I think he definitely needed the tempo of being on the play to take, take down game two. Oh, d definitely. I think on the draw, th there's no chance for Todd to stay into that one. And there was a lot of turns there early on in the game where it was a little bit awkward for Todd. He had to choose between make a proactive play or leave up to Stainful Stroke. Yeah. There's a couple points there in the middling turns where his colored mana distribution wasn't right. You know, he had double blue and only one white source of mana. The Prairie Stream was responsible for both. So if he cast Dig Through Time, now suddenly he yeah. can't follow up with Soulfire Grandmaster, which is very odd. You know, like we mentioned, we're just used to, okay, Jeskai Black's got seven lands in play, and we don't have to worry about the specifics of the colored mana. Everything's fine. Yeah. Todd was getting tripped up a little bit there by his distribution of colors, but still was able to pick some very tight lines there, maximize his resources very well, and was able to come back from what looked to be an insurmountable hole. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there was a turn where Todd had six lands. He went through a dig through time, but all his blue and white mana were tied up in the same two lands. So once he cast a dig through time, he left himself with, I believe, Swamp, Mountain, and two black-red dual lands. Great lands, but just 
not lining up the right way. It meant he had to take planes off a dig through time, which I think was a really painful thing for him to have to do. Especially with the amount of mana that he had in play. It wasn't like yeah, he was training for... up. It's not like he was training for quantity of mana. He just needed a particular set of colors there. But uh, again, very nicely done there by Todd. Uh, that game too there. Uh, I don't know if there's a lot of players in the room that would have been able to get that one. All right, well, we are going to shortly get back into the game here. Todd is back on the draw. Game one... We saw just how good that tempo can be when Jared curves out. Todd had very wisely had a disdainful stroke game, or rather a negate game one that he was holding for Gideon, and he felt like he had to, just couldn't beat a Gideon. And indeed, Jared had a Gideon, so Todd played it well. But the issue was that by holding up that mana, Todd held back his own development, and in the end, a curve of creatures was just too much to overcome. He, he was in this bind, you know, he had to commit to the board and hold up negate, couldn't afford to do both. We go on toward game three. So. So obviously he can't interact with those. Those fast starts are going to be problematic for Todd. But I mean, what I'm impressed about is that he has done just remarkably his first two games, and none of it has hinged on Jace at all. That, yeah, that, that is definitely noteworthy. Oh. That, that is the card that puts the deck on easy mode when Jace isn't killed. You're so efficient. The selection is valuable because you have all different types of effects in your deck. Uh, you contain the board. You, you flash back for value, all that. And, and Anderson has not had it yet. He's faced down two extremely good draws from Bauer and has somehow managed to get one of the two. Right. And now he's just crossing his fingers, hoping that Bauer doesn't open up on the same <laughs> excellent yeah. open we saw in game one. I mean, and that's why we see four copies of Abzan Agar in the top eight, right? Because curving out like that is not, you know, it doesn't take a miracle for Abzan to do that. No. Todd going to take go down to six. For the scratch, should still be able to recover. When he has lost games in this matchup, when he loses to that curve out, it doesn't seem to matter whether he's down a card. He's dying with cards in hand. Yeah. And part of the problem is that his removal doesn't line up that well against a lot of threats in Bauer's deck. He's good at responding when he has a lot of mana or when he has the cushion to leave up mana open. But when you put him under the gun, he doesn't have a lot of ways to untap and answer Anafenza or untap and answer Siege Rhino. These are challenging things for him to do. So if Bauer jumps on top of him early in the game, there's not a whole lot of recourse that Anderson has. Some other updates on the bracket. Our backup match, that was Hunter Nance on Obzon Blue playing against Jamie Collier. Hunter Nance's Obzon Blue won that one in 2-0. So that's who the winner of this match is going to face. Either Jared Bauer or Todd Anderson will play Hunter Nance in top four. So we're underway game two. No Warden of the first three, turn one for Jared, but it's going to happen on turn two. He had two lands, two great lands in play, neither of them able to cast a turn one Warden, though. So a, some reprieve for Todd, though, not a lot. Turn one Warden pump, turn one Warden, turn two pump versus turn two Warden, turn three pump, very, very different. And right now, I will say with the top eight, we have some other updates coming in. Obs on aggro, boy, has that been the deck to beat. Hunter Nance, 2-0 beating Jamie Collier, mentioned that. Uh, our one green-red Eldrazi player, Tyler Barnett, he lost the rematch to Matt Tumovich. Tumovich with Obzon Agro was able to take that one down. So he'll be in the semis as well, leaving, you know, very few non-Rhino players left in the tournament. Yeah, we're looking at basically Eric Smith and potentially Todd Anderson. Yeah, both of them playing game three. We'll try to bring you as much of those matches as we can. Todd, a second land and pass. Jared will fetch on end step. Now has four colors of mana in play, so excellent mana in that regard. Though I will say something that we've been noticing this weekend is that two dual lands in play, well, of course, that looks great. Um, these can be pretty punishing because when, when the players start to top deck additional battle lands, they all enter the battlefield tapped. We've seen this involving openings with the battle lands. I've seen it with Land of War Waste. I've seen it with Mystic Monastery. When people open up on a non-basic land on the first turn, in these battle land heavy mana bases, there are stumbles throughout the rest of the game. So Warden swings in. Jared does not want to pump in the face of that open mana. Todd takes one, goes to 18. Jared does have a follow-up, though. It's Anafenza the foremost. We go back to Todd. No end step play. So for Todd, it's just been lands on the first two turns. Now down two creatures to zero. Say it's a concern, but Todd has a bullet hiding out in his hand. Well, he does have his, po his copy of Planar Outburst. The issue is his mana is not lining up the right way. He's got a Swamp and an Island, no white mana in play, a Bloodstained Mire in his hand. Bloodstained Mire can't find white mana. Yeah, it's the mutual right. It's a black red, can't find white. And he does not have a lot of time, nor is he representing much in the way of removal right now. In spots like this, normally Bauer has to respect the possibility of Crackling Doom if he gets too uh, aggressive with his use of mana, pumping certain things, but Todd's not representing a whole lot right here. I suppose all 
Jared really has to respect his counter spells. And you see, he's going to respect that. He just makes Warden a 3-3 and attacks with a pair of 4-4s. Here's 8. You know, doesn't want anything countered here. Now his creatures are both out of range of Fiery Impulse, and he's going to make another Warden. This is excellent for Jared. Yeah, nothing wrong with casting this. Uh, Todd not representing Plinter Outburst. And draws, draws Utter End, no white source, nothing he can cast, and an extension of the hand for Todd Anderson. Things do not come together for him game three. And with that, it is Jared Bauer and Obs on Aggro defeating Todd and moving into the semifinals. Some mana issues there for Anderson, some excellent draws from Bauer, and the Obs on Aggro deck not giving you a whole lot of margin for error. Yeah, and you know, that's, we remember that from last season, continuing into this season. Boy, does it, you know, there are those decks that just punish stumbles, and Obs on Aggro is top of the list. You see just, you know, Todd had lands, spells, missed one of his four colors, and just game over. And Todd has to sideboard so much to respect the top end of the deck. He needs to have cards like Disdainable Stroke to protect himself from cards like Siege Rhino and Gideon. None of those cards were players in the games where, where Todd was defeated. It was just the low end of the curve. The fact that Todd doesn't have removal, there's no real Valor stances, no Silk Wraps. He doesn't have good removal that's right. reliable for Anafensa. And when Bauer opened with that card on the play, it felt like, well, Todd's going to take at least eight points of damage. There's, there's no real way to avoid it here. All right, we have one more match with top eight implications on the line. This is Aaron Sorrells Sorrels versus Eric Smith. It's the 1v8. We're going to try to catch the tail end of that match. Eric Smith was on Jeskai Black, Aaron Sorrells on Obs and Aggro, so it's the same matchup, but a little different. Eric Smith is playing cards like Mantis Rider this weekend, so has more of that aggro tempo style plan. Yeah, it's more of a classic build of the deck, not quite the same six.